right. Hello, everyone. We are the Big Short Group, um, a book written by Michael Lewis. And with me, I have Veer, Jordan, Ivy, Ashwin, and myself, Alex. So an overview of the book. The book focuses on a few individuals who foresaw the 2007-2008 financial crisis and were able to profit off of it. The opportunity was caused by an increasingly risky securities underwritten by mortgage loans. Wall Street was too, so hungry for profit in the fixed income market that they ignored, ignored warning signs and the risk that came with the loans they were giving out. Rating agencies were eventually forced to rate these securities triple A, yet it relied on the housing price housing prices to keep rising. So as more and more Americans fail to pay their mortgage, the industry starts to slowly fall, taking down both the lenders and those who borrowed. The opaque nature of these securities and the Wall Street trading desk compounded the crisis. Eventually, multiple banks would fail and many others required bailouts. The individuals the book focused on profited, but the American public suffered at the hands of Wall Street. To the right, we can see how these low level loans can cause the housing market to fall due to more and more failing mortgages. Now we'll talk about some of the important characters in the book. The first one is Dr. Michael Berry, who began as a medical doctor and grew to investment prowess by giving investment advice via online forums. He founded Scion Capital and was quickly approached by multiple large scale investors who'd actually been tracking his trading strategies. Berry was known as obsessive and was actually eventually diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, which allowed him to read the 130 plus page long prospectus of hundreds of mortgage backed security bonds. This convinced him that many of these bonds were destined to default, and he purchased $1.9 billion in CDSs against them. Barry was one of the first investors to identify the coming default. However, his bedside manner with clients led him to become actually quite hated. And despite making them $750 million, he became a villain of Wall Street for his money handling tactics. The next character is Steve Eisman, who was an investment manager at Front Point, Manage Front Point Partners. Those who worked for him um, said that he was brash and inconsiderate, but Eisman saw himself as a champion of the underdogs and simply used his personality as a tool against large Wall Street firms. Steve was approached by Greg Lippman, who we'll talk about later, and eventually was convinced that both mortgage-backed securities and CDOs were bad news. He amassed over a billion dollars of bets against them, and once he resold the insurance contracts, he cleared over $700 million in profit. However, Morgan Stanley, who owned his firm, was actually going into bankruptcy as he was making this money. And this just shows the lack of communication between firms. The next character is Greg Littman, who is the head mortgage backed security trading salesman at Deutsche Bank. He was famed for saying that he has no loyalty to Deutsche Bank, he simply works there. Uh, he took a presentation titled Shorting Home Equity Equity Mezzanine Tranches on a Roadshow and convinced investors of the corruption um, and inevitable downfall of mortgage-backed securities. Having convinced Deutsche of his viewpoint, he maintained short positions uh, with multiple other Wall Street banks regarding MBSs. And when the crisis hit, he had leverage to get full value for these contracts from falling banks. In one scenario, Deutsche received $1.2 billion from Morgan Stanley. When it was all over, Littman cleared $47 million in profit for himself just from selling CDSs. The last main characters are Charlie Ledley and Jamie Mai, who started Cornwall Capital in Jamie's garage with $130,000 to their name. They bought stock options trying to exploit market inefficiencies, and they were viewed as retail investors by Wall Street, which meant they had to fight really hard to be able to purchase CDSs once they saw the coming downfall of loans. When they were finally able to purchase these contracts, they were not in favorable terms for them, so that when they were cashing out on the coming fall, they were actually only able to get 30 cents on the dollar for their contracts. However, they were still able to clear $60 million in profit. 
all of these characters came from different backgrounds and had different amounts of relationships on Wall Street. However, their ability to think outside the box and pursue hunches allowed them to profit massively from the crisis. Yet, all expressed remorse afterwards as they considered the ramifications of their actions on everyday Americans. Here are some key terms in the book. The first one is collateralized debt obligation. CDO is a complex structured finance product that is backed by a pool of loans and other assets and sold to institutional investors. There are two main problems with CDOs. First one, its underlying assets are worthless. The other problem is CDO is always overrated by rating agencies. Synthetic CDO is a type of CDO where you use credit default swipe to obtain exposure of fixed income assets. Mortgage-backed security is a type of asset-backed securities, which is backed by home mortgages. The mortgage-backed security turns the back into a middleman between the home buyer and investment industry. A bank can grant mortgage to its customers and then sell them on at a discount for including an MBS. Securitization is a process where issuers form a financial instrument by pulling various financial assets, such as home mortgage, commercial mortgage, into one group and selling this repackaged asset into investors. Subprime mortgage is a type of loan issued to borrowers with low credit scores. The interest rate associated with a subprime mortgage is usually high to compensate lenders for taking the risk that the borrower will default on the loan. FICO score is a credit score. It's also a method of evaluating borrowers' credit worthiness. The range of score is from 300 to 850, with scores in 670 to 739 range can be considered as a good credit history. Teaser rate is an introductory rate charged on credit products such as credit card, adjustable rate mortgage. The rate of these products is not fixed. After the initial stage of the loan, a higher rate will apply. Trenches. Trenches are segments of a pool of securities carrying different yields, maturities, and degrees of risks. Credit default swipe. CDS is just like the insurance on debt. The buyer of CDS pays a premium to seller. If the debt product defaults, the seller will pay the buyer a predetermined amount. To understand the housing crisis, it's important to look at the events that preceded it. After the tech bubble burst in 2001 and a recession resulted, Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve Chairman at the time, cut interest rates down to 1%. This caused a great deal of malinvestment in the housing sector and many bad loans were originated in 2003 to 2004. A lot of them were the ones that were defaulted on from 2006 to 2008. The low interest rates and cheap credit allowed for excessive credit fuel demand for housing, which resulted in high prices. Furthermore, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, the government-sponsored housing enterprises, agreed to purchasing a lot of the subprime mortgage loans. Normally, private banks wouldn't give out these loans, but because they could sell them to Freddie and Fannie, they relaxed their standards. Plus, Freddie and Fannie guaranteed the mortgage-backed securities that they originated. Many people assumed there was an implicit guarantee that the government would bail Freddie and Fannie out if they went broke trying to ensure these guarantees. Wall Street investors turned out to be right. Most of the subprime loans were also adjustable rate and not fixed rate. So as the Fed continued to do small rate hikes up to 5%, a lot of the people who had mortgages couldn't afford the higher interest payments. This led to a drop in demand for housing as credit became more expensive. Many people became underwater on their homes and they, since they didn't put up an initial down payment, they decided to default. This resulted in a huge supply and low demand for housing, which put drastic downward pressures on housing prices cheap money and easy credit policies that occurred after the tech bubble, the housing bubble and financial crisis would have never occurred. The correction hurt everyone who was betting on the housing sector. Investment banks like Lehman Brothers, the fourth largest at the time, went bankrupt and had to dissolve. Freddie and Fannie also went bankrupt and had to get bailed out by the government. 
AIG, a major insurance company, became insolvent from insuring lots of credit default swaps and required a loan from the Fed. Many institutions on Wall Street got bailed out by the government instead of facing the consequences of their miscalculated actions. On the commercial bank side, many banks became a lot more hesitant with their lending approaches as Fannie and Freddie weren't there to sell loans to. Plus, some of them had lost capital on mortgages that went bad. The credit crunch that ensued ravaged the economy since it was highly driven by debt finance consumption. When 70% of GDP is based on consumption and there's very minimal savings, taking away the avenues that let Americans spend beyond their means results in a massive economic downturn. The response to this whole situation was the Dodd-Frank bill, a series of regulations that were passed to counteract the speculative actions taken on Wall Street. The well-intentioned bill has made it harder for small banks to originate and provide credit to communities that it's usually inaccessible in. Dodd-Frank regulations reared their head earlier this year as they were the principal reason Robinhood had to restrict the purchase of GameStop shares. The Big Short discusses concepts that help educate and make readers aware of the, what led to the housing crisis, which devastated millions and had effects that were felt for years to come. By understanding the major patterns that led to the housing crisis, we can not only help prevent the crisis from occurring, but also make the financial and investing institutions more efficient and beneficial for society. The lack of transparency is one such pattern. The information gap continued to widen as certain information was continuously held from the public. It was through this difference in information that investors were misled into believing that their investments were safer than they actually were. One major reason is the jargon that was used by Wall Street that kept information internal. For instance, a term like CDO squared, which refers to when one CDO, such as CDO A, could have parts of CDO B, and they could both be put inside another CDO, CDO C, essentially a CDO of the CDO. It was this type of complexity and obscurity that helped keep the truth hidden. Next, the lack of accountability. There were little to no regulations to help protect investors. As a result, there was often little enforcement, which led to little accountability. And this created conflicts of interest. For instance, banks would often offer mortgages to families that could not afford it so that brokers would have a more continuous supply of mortgages to sell. These brokers were aware that they could earn a greater return at the expense of buyers and homeowners with zero risk. Additionally, rating agencies such as S&P and Moody's knowingly kept the rates of the subprime bonds at AAA despite mortgage default rates increasing. They continued to do this because they were pressured from banks to give them the ratings that the banks wanted or else the banks would simply move on to their competitors. Next is underestimating risk. A combination of ignorance, hubris, and greed is what led to the housing bubble becoming so large and having such a detrimental impact while only a handful of people actually noticing the problem. These characteristics were compounded by the high level of confidence in the housing market. For instance, the median price of homes continued to rise year after year, reaching a high of 275,000 when starting 150,000 just a few years prior. So even when the default rates of subprime mortgages were rising, the demand remained high and investors refused to readjust their portfolio and failed to diversify. Thank you.